Welcome back everyone, our photo reviews here, helping you decide, is that book worth reading over second breakfast? Or does it deserve the fiery pits of Mount Doom? What'd you do with Mount Doom? I'm just kidding, she didn't do nothing to Mount Doom. It... Complicated reason why Mount Doom isn't here, even though we're back in the room, but uh... Long story short, my apartment got bombed for roaches, so... Anyways, we continue on with the Spooktober TBR, because it's definitely still October, and it is still near Halloween. Merry You're further out of your lane than me, old man. Back off. <laughs> Anyways, today's book is The Presence by John Saul. The Presence by John Saul, because I totally know what the book is right now. The Presence was first published on May 28th of 1997, obviously by author John Saul. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't find anything else on the background of this book, despite its old age, and it's relatively... Well, I want to say this book itself has a cult following, but it's relatively... The author's relatively decent cult following. There's a lack of awards or commendations, at least any that are worth bringing up. Though I can say, at least within my own circle, again, this has a very decent cult following, where John Saul is often considered an underappreciated horror author. So, you know, I don't have much else to say, so here's a, the quick report card to get you guys started. And we move on to the cover. The cover I have is actually fairly decent. Uh, as you can, I mean, as you can see, it's got a stark, it's got a nice stark contrast between the colors. You know, that, that dark, that, that blackness on top of that bright orange from the spewing volcano. It does very nice to set the scene and, you know, it does give you some hint to what this book is about without outright spoiling it like some covers might. You know, just enough that when you're done with the book, you look back and you think, hmm, okay, yeah, I can see why that's the cover art. But actually, strongly speaking, when it compared, when I compare this cover, my cover, to the one that I often find on Goodreads, I actually like this cover a lot more. Um, the Goodreads one, while I think is a better cover separated from the book, kind of gives you a false impression. The the lava on the cover, at least from the, the pictures I've seen, doesn't quite look like lava. It looks more like a sulfuric river. It looks more like a sulfuric river of some kind, which could still work based on what happens in the book. But that that skull in the, 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 the um, greenish-yellow clouds in the distance also give off a sort of wrong impression of what the book is about. It's, it doesn't really have supernatural elements as both the title and this cover would suggest. It's a more of a sci-fi thriller book, to, to be uh, concise, I guess, would be a good way of putting it. It also implies that the threat in the book is a farther reaching threat than it actually is, where it only really affects a small minority of people. So, all in all, like I said, I prefer my cover, and that cover is pretty decent for what, it, what it's going for. But let's move on to the synopsis. Now, the synopsis of this book is fairly simple. A woman named Catherine Sunderquist moves to Maui with her son, Michael Sunderquist, after being offered a job that is a little too good to be true. Now, Catherine Sunderquist... Catherine, I'm just going to call her Catherine, so I don't have to keep saying Sunderquist. Catherine is an anthropologist who is interested in the study of early man within the African nations. Her son, more the... He's the more focused character for a good portion of the book. Her son is an average teenage boy who's trying to overcome her his asthma to become the star track player of his team. And while in New York, he's dealing with a ton of bullies. However, she com he's convinced to come to Maui after a particularly nasty run-in with one of the bullies. Now, while in Maui, Michael becomes basically the cool kid at the school. At uh, first, being, being targeted because he's a howley which uh, I'm not sure if it's Polynesian slang or just slang that developed over time, but it's basically slang for white people who come over and much and invade basically native culture. But he makes fast friends with a group of boys, gets into scuba diving, and so on. However, after a late night scuba dive ends with a near disaster as three of the tank, four of the ta four of the five boys' tanks run out of air way before it should have. The strange things begin to happen. One of his friend group winds up dead before the end of the night. And then 
the re- the surviving members of the friend who begin to notice odd changes, uh, very notably a shortness of breath most commonly. Now, Michael obviously attributes this to his asthma, but the other boys never had it, and to them, it's much weirder. This also coincides with Catherine's plot line, which is trying to discover the origin of what seems to be a prehistoric man, uh, prehistoric man, like human skull, in an area that where prehistoric man did not exist, and trying to discover what's going on, all while her employer, it may, it may turn out that the person who employed her actually did... G- did give her a job that was too good to be true. And that's basically the synopsis. Uh, I can't give you any more without spoiling, so we'll just go ahead and move on to the review. So to start off, I'll, I just felt I need to mention that when it comes to John Saul, I have heard a lot about him, again, in my in the booktuber circle. A lot of the horror tubers on this, on this platform, specifically horror booktubers, I guess I should say, Often to tell me that John Saul is an underrated uh, horror author when compared to the likes of, say, you know, Stephen King or. Okay, I don't, I don't read a lot of horror novels, so I can't give you a bunch off the top of my head. But, needless to say, you know, he he's underappreciated is what I'm told a lot. Unfortunately, and, and so when I went into this book, I had high hopes that this book would surprise me and and give me, you know, something really good to sink my teeth into. And I'm afraid to say, at least as far as this book goes, it unfortunately did not meet my expectations, you know, completely. I guess to a degree it did, but compared to what I was expecting, not really. Now, when the book starts, it's, it's a fairly promising book. At first, you're given what looks like a flash forward where a young man who's been struggling with breathing problems ends up seemingly taking his own life by, you know, sticking himself in a garage and closing the door. Now, obviously, you get more context later on that completely changes what this scene is. And, but you're left with a good portion of the book thinking that this is Michael and Catherine in the future. This is obviously not true, I I guess, to give a small spoiler here. So, but, uh, but you go through most of the book thinking, ooh, that's a nice mystery. I wonder what led to this. And, you know, a fair amount of the character work is pretty decent. Michael Sunderquist is a... Really good character that, you know, felt real and fleshed out. And his mother, Catherine, although I wouldn't necessarily say to the same level of depth, is pretty good. And since there are two main characters, obviously this works really well in the book's favor. Like I said, but ultimately I found this book a little more disappointing than I was hoping for. There were a lot of things where I felt that it would have been good if the other author had taken different routes. Or maybe done different things with certain characters or something like that. That would have made the book a lot more interesting than it really was. For example, despite the fact that Michael makes friends with this group of native kids, even saving Josh Milani's life, who is the main best friend he makes, in that in a when Josh Milani basically is stuck in a diving spot, you ultim you would think that these characters would become more important to the story overall but you're kind of left wanting as the book goes on one of them dies like right away and then the other three like not even the other three the other two get like barely any mention despite being barely any depth i guess is the way to put it josh milani isn't too bad you do understand what he is but it's it's a more of a stereotypical kind of character you know the smart aleck kid who Seems like a problem to any good mother, but it turns out he just has a very bad family life and his smart aleckness is his way of coping. However, when it comes to his, the other friend, Jeff Kina, I can't tell you a thing about Jeff Kina as a character other than the fact that he's a big guy. Because the book wasn't really interested in exploring him as a character, despite being one of the characters that, you know, is... is that has been a, that has had this change happen to him. Also, due to the fact that both Jeff and Josh are four letters long and start with a J, I kept mistaking the uh, the names for each other. I kept switching the characters in my head, and that was kind of an issue. Uh, another issue is the character, the one character who doesn't start undergoing these strange transformations, a uh, Rick Santoya. I'm not gonna be able to tell you the name off the top of my head, but his name is Rick. And he doesn't seem to be undergoing any of these changes, and the book more or less just forgets about him. He's present in the scenes, but he's just kind of 
standing in the background doing nothing every time. And Ambrose, journeyman mage of the West Haven Wizards School. Dude, don't forget Mark. What? Oh, right. Mark the Red. So you're kind of left wanting when it comes to him because you think, you know, maybe he's going to play a bigger part being the one kid who went on the uh, night dive and nothing's happening to him. And all of his other friends are either disappearing or dropping dead. And you would think, you know, maybe he has a bigger role to play. But no, the story's not interested in him in the slightest. And that was that was kind of unfortunate. And a lot of that can be said for the main villain and most of Catherine's side characters as well. Um, Rod Sil- Rob Silver, the person who gives Catherine this job and a former and now current love interest for her, is very underutilized. He He pops up as a saving grace near the end but again i'm not sure i could tell you anything about him um the main bad guy his motivations are super unclear i really don't understand why he wants the MacGuffin so bad or why he's using the MacGuffin in the way that he is um it's just you, you know you would think corporate greed but even the chapters that focus on him he seems to have a very laissez fair kind of nature to his money. You don't get the feeling that money is his life. He, you, you. I just wish his exploration, his motives had been explored a lot more in this book than they were. He, he's just kind of the typical rich, evil CEO who's evil for no reason. Which, I guess, is fine, but not for a story like this. I guess that kind of leads me to my point, uh, or I guess the final point of... I'm not really sure how to feel about the MacGuffin. That that is the titular strange thing that's making the plot revolve. Obviously, one of the prologues, there's actually two prologues in this book, but one of the prologues opens with them retrieving this MacGuffin and showing the significant loss of life that is caused in the need to get it. And you would think with, with uh, as much focus is placed on it, it would be some kind of... I don't know, you think there would be more to it, but the actual reveal to what it is I found a little disappointing. It, it feels a little, not built up at all. I mean, you there's, there is a side character who kind of builds it up a little bit throughout the book, but he almost seems irrelevant to the plot near the till near the very end. And it, like I said, it just feels, it's disappointing and it just seems to come out of left field to me. I mean, I had a lot of theories on just what this MacGuffin was going to be, but what it actually was just didn't feel satisfying in a way, especially with the name of a book called The Presence. You would expect the MacGuffin to, at the very least, be a more sentient kind of thing. You know what I mean? You don't call something The Presence and it's literally something that can't even think or feel. You, you would think it's some kind of at least supernatural threat that malevolent to some degree like you know color out of space you that that's the kind of threat i was i guess expecting to a degree maybe not necessarily a a a direct living thing that operates the way we understand but at least something that seems to have a motivation but and doesn't just exist and our main villain is the one causing all the issues I, i okay Here's a, actually, here's a good way of putting it. I was expecting something like The Marker from Dead Space, where it's not necessarily something that is living, but it is something that has an aura to it which causes the events of the book to take place, like in Dead Space Martyr, or just in the Dead Space franchise in general. You, you would think that with something called The Presence, the presence would actually be the main threat, not the guy who... You know, the more I think about it, I just don't understand why it's called The Presence, to be perfectly honest with you. So with that being said, I guess I'd have to give this book like a 5 out of 10. Um, I don't hate the book, but I certainly... I would certainly say it's boring, and I don't think that this is the John Saul work I would recommend people if I do come to see him as the underappreciated author I've been told he is. Not that I think all of his works are like this, obviously. Every author has bad books, has mediocre books, when they, if they write enough, a big enough bibliography. Not every Stephen King book's a winner, not every Bram Stoker book's a winner, but both of those are considered definitive authors in the horror genre. Like I said, to me it just felt like I was sludging through a lot of the points, and eventually when I got to the end, all I could do was look around and say to myself, that was it. I, I, I'm not sure I would recommend this book personally, 
other than to, you know, hardcore John Saul fans or people who enjoy more cozy thrillers, I guess, if that's a thing. I want to say it's cozy. I would say it's more of a level thriller, I guess, if that makes sense. But ultimately, I'm just not terribly certain it's worth the read. Does it deserve Mount Doom, though? No? I I'm mostly just saying that because there is a lot of interesting ideas in here, and there are points where the book did make me sit up and wait eagerly for the conclusion, even if that conclusion was just kind of a... It's not bad enough that I got angry or couldn't finish, but... I can't say it ever enthused me. Maybe this is something I'll come to appreciate when I come to know John Saul's works a little better, but for now, I can't I can't say it was a great read for me. But with that being said, just remember, with every book co comes an adventure, and every adventure is worth having, even the bad ones.